Hey everybody, it's Dan, your friendly fishmonger from dansfish.com and today we have a species that I'm really excited to talk to you about. This is a little killifish that is beautiful. You'll see it in just a minute. Trust me, it's gorgeous and it's hardy and it's fun. This is Aphiosimian caliurum from Ogun in Nigeria. I'm so thrilled to have these and to tell you about them, so let's take a look and go over them and talk a little bit about killifish in general while we're at it. All right, enjoy. Okay, here the little guys are. And as you can see, they're absolute gems. Look at that male in kind of the upper right-hand side. He's gonna cross the screen in a second here and flare out and you'll see his oranges and his yellows. What you don't see real well is on, on his body, he's got a bunch of red dots all over his body, which is really, really pretty. So gorgeous fish, highly sought after fish. And I think some of the hardiest fish, some of the easiest fish to keep. I want to, in this video, talk about how I keep them and dispel some of the myths that keep people from trying killifish. Now, when killifish first started being kept in the hobby, they were kept like in little plastic containers, little tiny aquariums, and basically the people that kept them were intent on breeding them and in general wanted to breed many, many different species. So what they would generally do is keep all these tiny little containers, often little plastic storage containers, um, and they would keep maybe one pair in each container, something like that, maybe a trio. And a spawning mop in the corner, for example, if it's a mop spawner. And what ended up happening, in the, happening is in that kind of setup, it's, it's pretty unnatural and I'm not knocking it. It works great if you have a small space and you want to just keep a ton of varieties. Um, but it's not a natural setup. Real quick, they're eating flake food. Okay, I just put flake food in here. You can see it on camera. They're, they're eating it just fine. I'll feed them pellets in a second so you can see that too. They're easy to feed. And I'll get to that myth in a second that they're hard to feed. But anyway, in the little tiny containers they were stored in, you'd have a mop in a corner. And in those setups, yeah, they're pretty shy. There's not a lot of places to hide. There's not a lot of environmental stimulus and things like that. So killie keepers generally keep their killifish not in the complete darkness, but in pretty subdued lighting, like no light right over the tank usually, or very dim, dim light, which makes it hard to see. So often you'll go to a killifish keeper's house and they'll hand you a flashlight and you go from container to container and look at the fish. Now again, please, there's nothing wrong with that. But I want to say there's another way to keep the killifish. This is a 75 gallon aquarium. Half the top of the tank, just about, has floating water sprite. Underneath that is java moss. There's a sponge filter, a box filter, and a spawning mop. Apart from that, it's a bare bottom tank. Now that's not a difficult tank to set up by any means, and it has enough cover that I can keep them in this bright light, observe them, enjoy them, see their more or less natural behavior, see them sparring and stuff every time I look at the tank. And they are not shy, they're not scared. As you can see, they're out and about and happy. And that's just because, here they go, pellets, chowing down. Um, and that's just because there's enough cover that they feel secure and they come out just like any other fish basically that you would keep in this hobby. So the idea that you have to keep them in these tiny little containers and that they're really shy and they don't like bright light and all that, yeah, maybe there's a few species where that kind of setup is better for them, but in general, at least all the fish I'm selling and that I keep, they're in these bright aquariums where you can really enjoy the color and the behavior. A second myth is that they're hard to feed. Well, as you can see, they just chow down on a bunch of flake food. They just chow down on pellets. And these fish have only been in captivity for a couple of weeks. I imported these from Nigeria two weeks ago today. So it was November 6th, 2018 when I brought these in. And they were pretty simple to train to eat flake food, to eat pellets. Now, of course, I feed them live food and I feed them frozen food and things, but that's not something that they would have to have to thrive. Um, even to breed, they could breed on a good quality flake food several times a day 
might be necessary to give them enough energy to really bulk up, but they can do it. So they're not difficult fish to feed at all. You don't have to raise a bunch of worms and a bunch of fruit flies and a bunch of uh, bean beetles and all that stuff to keep these guys fat and healthy. Uh, on that note, by the way, you're going to see quite a few fish in this video that have some tattered fins or that are a little skinny. See, I put my hand in here just because I wanted to show you how unshy they are. They didn't scatter. I'm in front of the tank with my hand in it, and they're still right out and about, and they're going to come up and investigate it and things. But anyway, the fish with tattered fins and kind of skinny, when I got these guys, their fins were in really bad shape. When I got them, they looked like clamped up brown darts. No color, fins completely clamped as tight as they could be, and um, they were in a little bit rough shape. So it's taken a while to get them recovering so they're doing much better but some of them still have some tattered fins and things so just so you know they're 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 in good shape they're doing fine they don't have a disease or anything it was just uh is it's rough on them when they're when they're imported at least it was for this batch so anyway not shy easy to feed can be kept in bright light and enjoyed like any other fish the other myth is that they're not community fish these guys can absolutely be kept with other peaceful community fish that are of an appropriate size. Of course they're going to eat a fish that fits in their mouth. Almost any fish would. And of course they're going to get eaten by any fish in whose mouth they would fit. Almost any fish would. But besides that, not difficult at all. And once they learn about the food, this species is pretty quick to it. So they're they're not going to easily be outcompeted. Now, a big mob of Danios or a big mob of Barbs or something like that might outcompete them for food. Um, you'd have to, you know, see and see how they work in your setup and all that and, and have a plan B. But besides fish that will absolutely mob the food, like I wouldn't keep these in a tank with 100 Danios because they would probably get mobbed out of the food. But uh, apart from that, great for community aquariums, I think. Now something that is absolutely true about these is they jump. They jump like nobody's business. They will find the tiniest crack and jump out. I've already ranted about this on the Epiplades <laughs> species Akayo video, so I won't rant again, but please, 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 if you're going to purchase these fish or the Epiplades, please have not just a lid but a tight-fitting lid or I promise you, you will find the fish dried up on the floor eventually even if you lower the water level a few inches. These guys can jump, I don't know, a foot in the air or more without too much problem. So just be aware of that. That's the one thing about killifish, I think, that makes them not work in every little peaceful community setup because often you have a rimless tank or something like that, and that's not going to work. Um, oh, and the other rumor is that they don't like water flow. Now, it's true that this species doesn't like high water flow. Absolutely. They aren't built for that. They're living in habitats where they're up on the margins of the streams, in the slower moving portions of the streams, or the uh, flooded pools and things like that. So yes, that's true. But that doesn't mean that they don't like a healthy amount of water flow. So the water in here is moving. It's not torrential. There's no power head or anything like that but it's definitely not, not stagnant. So you can have a good, heavily bubbling sponge filter and box filter in here, and they'll be just fine. Um, there's plenty of water on the other side of the tank that isn't moving very quickly. So as you can see though, from all the little particulates in the water, it is flowing and that helps keep it clean and oxygenated and all that. Now, there's one disease that these guys are very prone to Luckily, in the two weeks I've had these, I haven't seen it yet, um, and I don't think I will because I've dosed them with copper, and I'll continue to dose them with copper until they've been sitting in it for <laughs> five days or a week, which should take care of any of the velvet. But I didn't start that copper bath until a day or two ago. So, but know that killifish um, are very susceptible to velvet. If you see that, if they clamp up and they start shimmying and they, they look like they have these kind of little iridescent, it's kind of like a dusting, a fine powder of copper on them more or less, then um, get some kind of chelated ick sulfate, or ick sulfate, copper sulfate, and that will treat them immediately. 
Um, that is the only way I know of to quickly and reliably take care of velvet. Now, not every killifish is going to get that, not by any means. Um, you know, Betta splendens gets velvet easily too, but not every Betta get it, gets it by any means. So it's not something that is going to happen, but it's one of the first suspects if you see your fish having some issues. So check for that if you notice anything is awry. It's very common in killifish. Um, yeah, I think that that's kind of the, the basic myths that I would like to kind of just discount. Oh no, there's another one. The big one is that killifish only last a few months or a year and then they die. Not true. Even the annual species, that's not true for all of them. So here's where that myth comes from. So a lot of killifish live in these habitats where they dry up every year or sometimes twice a year in the case of like Nothobronchius furzeri and things like that. So the killifish hatch when it rains, they grow real fast, they breed, they lay eggs in the mud, the pool dries up and the eggs live in the dried up mud until it rains again. And then the eggs hatch and there's a new explosion of baby fishes, right? Well, yes, in the wild they only live sometimes a few months or sometimes, you know, nine months until the pool dries up again. And that's true of annual species. And in the aquarium, those don't, aren't typically extremely long-lived, but most of them you'll get a year or more out of, 18 months out of, some even longer. Uh, Furzeri, yeah, that, okay, that one's, that one's pretty short-lived, but most aren't as short as you think. Now, killifish like this one, um, in fact, all the killifish I have currently are non-annual species. The places they live do not dry up. And these guys will live in, in your aquarium just as long as similarly sized fishes, just as long as a similarly sized live bearer, like a guppy or a platy or something like that. In fact, they're very, very, very closely related to live bearers. The main difference, killifish lay eggs, live bearers have live young. But there's a little bit of kind of crossover. There are, there are killifish that have internal fertilization, and there are quote-unquote live bearers that lay eggs. So it's, it's, it gets interesting, but we won't get on that. But anyway, they, they aren't going to die on you in a couple months or a year goes up and so they automatically just croak. That, that doesn't happen. Now, they are like any other fish. Yes, they can survive in pretty horrendous environments, many species, toxic environments like the Aphanius and some of the pupfish and things, just really salty or really polluted sometimes. Not that that's what they want to do, but sometimes they find themselves in that situation. But that doesn't mean that they don't appreciate nice, clean water. So, um, you know, I treat them like any other aquarium, keep the water nitrite pretty much free, ammonia free, free nitrate low. In fact, nitrite's zero. I, I don't want to say pretty much free. <laughs> I don't register ammonia or nitrites in my tanks unless something's horribly gone wrong. But um, in nitrates, I keep pretty low. So they're a tolerance fish. They're, they're really pretty hardy, but you know they'll appreciate being kept in nice water like any other fish pretty much would. Spawning is pretty simple. I haven't done it yet. I mean, I, I just barely got these guys two weeks ago and have been worried about getting weight on them, clearing up damaged fins and, and getting them, you know, acclimated and used to aquarium foods and all that. So I haven't, I haven't really gone into the breeding yet, but a simple mop made out of acrylic yarn, and I have a video on how to make mops if you want to check it out. They'll lay their eggs on that. You pick those out and you incubate them in water just like a rainbow fish. I use a little bit of hydrogen peroxide and I change the water in that container every day and put hydrogen peroxide in it, sometimes two or three times a day. I change the water on those, depends on my schedule. And they'll hatch in, I'll say, a couple weeks. And, um, and yeah, you'll have baby fish that are usually big enough to take baby brine shrimp. So they're, they're a lot bigger than, say, most of your barbs and danios and tetras and things. Um, pardon the camera adjustment. I was going to uh, try to get some close-ups, which kind of failed. But we're wrapping up here, so I'm not going to worry about changing too much on that. Um, oh, where was I? Oh, yeah, so that's kind of how you breed these guys. Or you can take the eggs out. You can incubate them on damp peat moss. 
and that's nice because then you can control when they hatch. So if you pick 10 eggs a day for three days, put them in the damp peat moss, if they all survive, then in a couple weeks or 21 days or whenever you see kind of the eye of the little baby fish through the egg, you can you know, submerge them all in shallow water and they'll hatch all at once. So it makes raising a big batch of fry that have all kind of are the same hatch date a lot easier than trying to raise 10 fry that were hatched one day and 10 fry that were hatched a few days later and then you get the size differences and it gets ugly. But yeah, so really simple fish in my opinion. Uh, most killifish species I've tried to breed and to raise. Again, most of them are big enough to take newly hatched baby brine shrimp, which makes them a cinch. Microworms, vinegar eels, all that stuff. Anyway, love these guys. Hope you like this. Uh, I think I got a little outro on this video, so we'll see you in a cut here now. Aphiosemen caliurum. What more could you want besides an easier name to pronounce, perhaps? <laughs> um, if you like this video, I'm going to do that standard thing where I say, please like, please subscribe, please share, please bleh, all over, right? But really, it helps. So if, if you're interested in all this stuff and, and you want to support, subscribing's wonderful, liking's wonderful, sharing's great, all that stuff. Um, if you notice, the lights are out behind me on this tank. Um, usually, it's a beautiful show tank and I can stand here in front of it and uh, it show it off, but it's super late. But I wasn't gonna go to bed today before I got this video edited. So thanks for hanging out. Um, if you have any questions about Aphiosemian caliurum ogun, then please leave them down below in the comments. We can geek out and have a good time. All right, thanks, bye-bye.